Tesla can potentially disrupt Uber's supply side via the deployment of hailable autonomous vehicles. If Tesla were to be the only provider of autonomous vehicles in the future, or one of few, this would likely lead to Tesla's robo-taxi network outcompeting Uber's in terms of cost, which would still have to employ human drivers. Over time, this scenario would degrade Uber's competitive position. In the autonomy market, we may see anything from a highly fragmented market to a winner-takes-all scenario evolve. In order to avoid this disruption across the spectrum, Uber must maximize asset utilization over time such that not plugging into Uber's network means losing a lot of money for AV providers, meaning autonomous vehicle providers, regardless of the market structure on the supply side. This requires maximizing two variables over time, audience size and frequency. The former is self-explanatory and the latter refers to how often customers engage with the Uber network. The more they engage, the higher asset utilization will be and the more money supply side participants lose by not plugging in. In order to protect itself from a future in which Tesla takes all of the AV market, Uber must therefore saturate the market. By saturation, I refer to Uber customers engaging with the platform so frequently and for such a broad range of essential daily activities like grocery, transportation, traveling and more that they do not conceive of migrating to an alternative network. In practice, this should take the form of Uber having a cost advantage across a broad spectrum of services and thus counteracting Tesla's lower cost in initially one specific area. For instance, Tesla may provide lower cost urban trips, but Uber customers would still feel reluctant to let go of the Uber One membership because this would ultimately imply a higher cost of living for them. This would incentivize Tesla to plug the AVs into Uber's network, which would simultaneously keep on growing by incrementally decreasing the cost of living for its customers across the board. I suspect that the above dynamic would be accentuated by a Netflix versus Disney Plus and others kind of situation. Since Netflix stock bottomed, we now have learned that profitably operating a streaming operation is not as easy as the market thought in May 2022. Netflix has demonstrated a superior ability to manage the complexities of doing so, and I believe that Uber will do the same in its domain, especially so if the autonomy space trends to a more fragmented nature. Going back to the frequency discussion, Uber One members spend 3.4 times more than non-members as they engage in multi-product consumption. Thus, Uber's number one KPI, Key Performance Indicator, other than MAPC, which stands for Monthly Platform Consumers, is what percentage of gross bookings Uber One accounts for. The metric has gone from 30% in Q4 2023 to 50% in Q2 2024. By including more services in the membership, Uber can gradually lower the cost of living for its members as described previously. In the February 2024 investor update, Uber disclosed that more than a third of monthly consumers were multi-product, as you can see in the graph below. This metric is up from 21% in Q1 2021, demonstrating Uber is capable of increasing frequency over time. However, this is still far away from saturation since as of Q2 2024, penetration is less than 20% in Uber's top 10 countries and half of the riders take only one or two trips per month. In the same period, Uber has managed to grow MAPCs considerably. This has been accomplished via the introduction of adjacent mobility verticals, which have enabled Uber to both tap into new audiences and drive further frequency. One example is Uber Moto, which in Q4 2023 accounted for 13% of consumer first trips and 19% of vehicle first trips. The combination of increased frequency and a bigger audience have yielded a rapidly growing EBITDA, especially on the mobility side, as you can see on the graph below. Here's what CEO Dara Khosrow-Shahi said about this matter during the Q2 earnings call. So John, in terms of mobility frequency, um, while uh, we're not gonna disclose you know, specifically what frequency looks like, I would say that when we look at lower cost products, when you look at Uber X share, uh, uh, hailables, two wheelers, three wheelers, the frequency of some of the newer products is significantly higher than the frequency of, call it, the X product, uh, et cetera. When you look at the overall frequency numbers for both mobility and delivery, they're up on a year-on-year -year basis. It is absolutely helped by multi-product usage. It is absolutely helped by membership as well. So whether, or whether you look at cohorts, whether you look at new customers, uh, high income, low income, um, the, the frequency numbers for us in both mobility and delivery are very, very constructive. To date, Uber has demonstrated an ability to deploy adjacent verticals, driving operating leverage over time. In Q2 2024, management announced that the advertising business 
is now at a $1 billion annual revenue run rate. This is interesting because advertising is beyond Uber's traditional circle of competence and because the business was only launched in October 2022. The advertising operation is therefore a further demonstration of Uber's ability to deploy verticals. While I am therefore unable to quantify what saturation looks like, I would at present be comfortable betting on Uber's ability to drive audience and frequency growth. The ultimate testimony of the ability to drive frequency and bring the resulting additional revenue to the bottom line is the growing net income and cash from operations as depicted in the graph below. Both metrics have risen steadily since 2020. Putting the Tesla versus Uber debate aside, it seems that further audience and frequency growth will be highly accretive to Uber's financials. In the past few years, Uber has managed to increase ARPU, average revenue per user, while containing costs as demonstrated by the rising net income and cash from operations. Uber CFO Prasanth Mahindra explained it very clearly in the Q2 earnings call. Yeah, thanks. For, thank you for the question. I think a, a good frame of reference or an example to help you with that, Tam, if, if the United States was to move to the TAM penetration that we're seeing in the UK, that's worth another $13 billion in gross bookings, caused 8% or so of our current run rate just by moving the US to the UK. I will be watching this situation closely going forward because I believe there is a valuable lesson to be learned. The Netflix example I cited earlier elucidated how investors can give up on a company after tremendous returns, only to then see it produce more incredible returns once they've abandoned ship, as you can see in the graph below. However, Netflix is a company with great vitality, as defined by Harrison Moot, which I linked to in my written article, and so is Uber in my view. Companies of this sort have a remarkable ability to carry on expanding their top line and bring more of it down to the bottom line. Uber has not quite faced a formidable adversary yet, and thus the likely battle with Tesla will be a great case study in the pursuit of getting better at identifying companies with high vitality. Until next time.